All right, so we have, um, I got three final questions or jokes for you. Ready? How do you have a successful solar system party? You plan it. Nicely done. Look at that. You guys are all dialed in. End of the semester, we're thinking, we're on the same wavelength. Okay, what happens when you eat yeast and shoe polish? You rise and shine. Wow, two for two. Let's go three for three. You ready? This one, I think you might get. Did you ever hear about that movie? Did you guys see the new movie theater? Has anybody been to the movie, new movie theater? Did you ever hear about the movie um, called Constipation? <laughs> it never came out. Nicely done. Three for three. You guys are ready for this final. Look at that. You aced it. All right. All right, now down to seriousness, if we can do that. Cardiovascular diseases, that's what we're finishing out the semester with. And first up, what I want you to do is I want you uh, to pretend you're an SI for this class. Actually, let's pause for a second. Um, how many of you guys really appreciated Iridia now that she's back this week? Can we give her a round of applause? <laughs> Everybody likes to clap for So let's pretend that you're an SI for 202. Because this is our review topic. I want you to draw a simplified picture of a heart on your piece of paper. Okay? Make it big enough because you're going to label stuff. Go for it. Like, I actually want you to write this down. All of you digital freaks are like, oh, pencil, pen. I don't think I have one of those. Could you do it on your tablet or your device? Or... And then you're going to label these four items. Right ventricle, left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium. Yes, you can shade it in, you can use colored pencils, that's fine. Make it three-dimensional. Make a flip book between systole and diastole, that's cool. Some of you are still trying to figure out how am I going to draw a heart? That's my heart right there. Did you guys figure that out? I was trying to be helpful. Yeah, that's how engineers draw hearts. How many of you are how many of you are romantics and you have a heart? Like like this one. Oh, Chloe, that's so cute. Oh come on, guys, come on, seriously. How many of you guys drew a heart like an actual Valentine's Day heart? Oh no, not that. Oh not that, okay. A couple of you? Don't be embarrassed. Come on, we've been together all semester. All right, so who wants to volunteer come up here and label the right ventricle, left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium? Come on, don't be shy. I'm making you walk. Oh, you chose, you chose the red marker, everybody. Let the record reflect the red markers being used. The right atrium. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Very good. What do you guys think? Yeah. Round of applause. <laughs> All right, which way does blood flow? On your diagram, draw the pathway of blood. This is actually somewhat relevant for this lecture, that's why we're doing this. <coughs> that's one of my favorite ways to do the review section of this. See what you remember. I'll give you a 
second, and then I'll ask the audience, I'll hold the audience. oxygenated at this point, or is it deoxygenated? It's deoxygenated. So where does it go to get oxygenated? To the lungs, okay? And what vessel takes it to the lungs? Pulmonary, pulmonary artery. Then from the lungs, where does it go? It, begins, it has gas exchange with the lungs. We just covered respiratory, uh, respiratory system last week. So it comes back in and it goes to where? Okay, to the left atrium from where? From the lungs. And what vessel brings it to the left atrium? Pulmonary vein. Okay, and then it comes through a valve right here. Which valve is this? Which one? Mitral. Mitral, otherwise known as bicuspid. Both are correct. And then from the left ventricle, where does it go? It goes to the body and uses what vessel to do that? It's only the largest one in the entire body. It's the aorta. It's very nicely done. Okay? So having a diagram, am I going to ask you specific questions on blood flow? Well, Possibly, but more importantly, I'm going to ask you about when things go wrong. And if you don't remember how it flows, I mean, this this took you know two minutes to actually draw out. Is there space on your exam to draw it out? Yeah. But would it be a good idea to sketch it out? I think so. It might help you think about where things are going, and how things flow, and maybe this question: What's the difference between preload and afterload? Anybody know the answer to that? Isn't afterload uh, more specific to expel the left of blood in the ventricle after contraction? Afterload is what? Say that again. Isn't afterload is more specific to expel the left of blood in the left ventricle after contraction occurs? Yeah, almost exactly correct. So afterload is the pressure on which the heart is working against to open up this aortic valve. I forgot about There's a valve right here. This is the aortic valve. And in order for flow to take place, P1 has to be greater than P2. So the pressure P1 in the left ventricle is greater than P2, aortic pressure, then the valve opens and you get blood flow. So afterload is the load the heart is working against in order to open up that aortic valve and allow flow to leave the heart. Afterload is also really synonymous with then what pressure that we measure. And we measured at the dentist's office now. Blood pressure. Thank you, blood pressure. That was new legislation as a result of affordable health care. So when you go get your eye exam, you go to the dentist, now you actually get your blood pressure taken. So blood pressure as mean arterial pressure is really the afterload that 
the body works against. Why am I bringing up all these review definitions? Because I'm going to hop to this. We're going to talk about conditions in patients where the afterload starts to chronically rise. It stays elevated and it never comes back down. So now the heart is a muscle that has to work harder. As it works harder against an increasing load, and many of you do this multiple times a week to get a response. What is that? Working out with skeletal muscle. Skeletal and cardiac muscle are very similar. They're both striated muscle, and they both undergo hypertrophy and result, result to increasing loads. Okay, that's why you change up your workout regime. You increase more weights. Okay, you mix it up throughout the day, or the week, rather. Okay, so you're trying to encourage skeletal muscle to respond. Well, cardiac muscle does the same thing. So we're going to look at diseases like in congestive heart failure or chronic heart failure, where the heart itself goes through a hypertrophic response. And understanding why does it swell, why does it get bigger, all comes down to understanding how these hemodynamics work. Okay? Now what's preload? Preload. The load on the heart before it contracts. Very good. What does that mean? <coughs> well, not necessarily. It's not about opening valves at this point. So preload refers more to contractility. So preload is defined as the muscle length prior to contraction, and it's directly proportional or dependent on ventricular filling, or what we know as venous return. So venous return, as venous return increases, this increases ventricular filling, and this in result increases preload. Let me explain. So during diastole, before it contracts, which is absolutely correct, there is a volume of fluid that comes into the right side of the heart, the filling side of the heart, the low pressure side of the heart. And as it fills, it stretches out the cardiac muscle. And as it stretches out the cardiac muscle, you get actinomycin cross bridges or overlapping situation where there is an optimization of where the maximum number of cross bridges are going to form. We saw this when we studied uh, muscle contraction in 201. And so if you fill the heart to a certain point where that overlap is maximized, when it's going to contract on the next heartbeat, you're going to get very forceful contraction. Does that make sense? So if you fill the heart just a little bit, it doesn't stretch quite as much. If you fill the heart more maximally, you get a larger stretch and the heart has elastin in it, so there's an elastic recoil that's working in concert with this, you're going to, when you contract, have the greatest amount of force. So preload is dependent upon ventricular filling or venous return. So this is what we refer to as Frank Starling's law of the heart. I don't know if you remember that from 202. And that, simply put, is the more that you put in, the more that you get out. So if you bring more blood flow back to the right side of the heart, on the next successive heartbeat, you're going to get a larger cardiac output. More inflow leads to a contraction event that pushes more output out of the heart. Make sense? So these are very important concepts because we're going to start looking at all sorts of problems. And if you don't understand how this all works, which is review, but maybe it was a review from a long time ago, or maybe it wasn't presented in this way the last time you saw it. Okay? Is that pretty clear? So that's like cardiovascular fizz in like 10 minutes, and we spend like, like a week on it in 202. Okay, you guys remember the Wiggers diagram? You're like, oh. Some of you are like, oh, don't say that word. Don't worry, we're not drawing the Wiggers diagrams. Okay, but you, this is a very simplistic heart. 
and it kind of has all the critical pieces for us to move through uh, in today's lecture, at least for the heart portion. And we're going to talk about blood vessels next. Okay, so the types of heart disease that we're going to cover, the, the five or the six biggies are shown here. We've got congestive heart disease, um, arterial sclerosis, ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, pericardial disease, and then congenital disorders. Uh, congenital disorders might fall in the category, maybe you know somebody that, that wrestles with this. Um, there is uh, blood shunting that takes place in the fetal circulation because you don't necessarily need to send blood to the lungs and then back. So you just shunt it across because the infant in utero is not breathing. So there's actually a hole between the right and the left side of the heart embryonically. And then the moment that you take your first breath, that piece of tissue, it's like a flap, closes because the pressures change. And then it just epithelializes over. And all of us, probably most of us, maybe there's a few, that don't that had that flap close off correctly, have appropriate blood flow to the lungs and the heart. In some cases, there is still a defect. And so now we use a septal occluder and we'll close those holes in, in, in infants' hearts. Okay? So, but I'm guessing in the classroom of this size, based on statistics, maybe one of you um, has experienced something like that. It's probably taken care of, especially in Western society. Uh, a larger percent of you know somebody that had a defect like that. I actually had a grad student um, that had a defect like that, and they didn't discover it until he was an adult. And he had that taken care of, uh, like in the last few years. Um, so we're not going to cover congenital diseases. And could, we could go down a whole pathway of lectures on that, which would be cool. But again, i got to keep this um, within the realm of general topics. Okay. So the first three that are uh, in dark black text are the ones we're going to cover, and the ones that are kind of grayed out we're not going to have a chance to cover. But the first one that uh, I want to cover on our list is uh, congestive heart failure. So congestive heart failure is a terminology um, that's really referring to the buildup of, of fluid. Because the heart's moving fluid, and if the fluid is not moving appropriately or well, then you get congestion. And that congestion uh, sticks around in the thoracic cavity. And primarily, it finds its way into the pleural space. Okay, so now you get this fluid, and we talked about this in the last lecture on the respiratory diseases. Usually, you have about 100 milliliters of fluid between the parietal and the visceral, visceral uh, membranes. And in congestive heart failure, you might have patients that will pull off a liter per day. So 10 times that amount, they're draining every day. So you can imagine a two liter Coke bottle, right? Half of that is a liter. And if you just sat on the ground, laid on the ground and put that on your chest, it, you would actually be able to feel that pressure. Now imagine if it was distributed around your entire pleural space. It would be very difficult to have a nice freely flowing breath. So we call this congestive heart failure, okay? The etiology, where it begins, a lot of times it comes from either two sources, endocarditis, which is an inflammatory disease of the inner layer of the heart, the endocardium, or more commonly today, we see it with abnormal loads. And the number one culprit of an abnormal load in Western society is elevated blood pressure. So you want to know why are we so paranoid about the patient's blood pressure? Well, if mean arterial pressure rises or your blood pressure, your systolic blood pressure and your diastolic blood pressure start to increase, and we'll talk about things that lead to that in the second half of the lecture today, then your heart has to work harder to get out the same amount of blood, right? That's the startling of the heart. So abnormal load is mostly what we experience clinically at least in our country and a lot of other Western countries. We say that it's a forward failure, forward failure meaning that we lose our cardiac output. Remember, our cardiac output is equal to our stroke volume times our heart rate. Right? Stroke volume 
is the volume that the heart moves per unit time. And, or per beat, excuse me. And then heart rate is the number of beats per unit time. So if you've got a stroke volume, say in liters per beat, and you've got heart rates in beats per minute, cardiac output is what? Liters per minute. Make sense? So these um, units cancel. Some of you are like, I didn't think we were going to have to know math. <laughs> Just a little bit, okay? So your cardiac output is the number of liters that you put out per unit time, per minute. And it's a function of the stroke volume and the heart rate. So if the mean arterial pressure is elevated, your heart has to work harder and it's not as strong, it'll pump out less volume per beat. If it's less volume per beat, and you need to maintain the same uh, cardiac output, the only other way to do that is to increase the number of beats per minute. So now the heart is working harder. Make sense? If it works harder as a pump, that's what it is, it's going to wear out. So forward failure problems are what we see with these patients that wrestle with congestive heart failure. Another name or terminology for congestive heart failure CHF is chronic heart failure, CHF. So in the literature, you'll see CHF as a terminology that some authors describe as congestive heart failure because they're talking about the fluid buildup. Other authors refer to it as chronic heart failure because they're talking about the chronic nature in time and it goes on for a long period. So the heart itself can, in fact, try to compensate. And it does this not so well, but it's got three different mechanisms on, on how it can try to do this. So the number one mechanism that's really quick, it happens, whoops, sorry, it happens really fast, is you release a catecholamine known as norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is another name for noradrenaline. It's um, used as a um, neurotransmitter in the nervous system, but it's also used as a catecholamine to upregulate sympathetic activity. So norepinephrine, noradrenaline, right? That adrenaline rush that we talk about, we're kind of talking about epinephrine, but its sister or its cousin is norepinephrine, very similarly uh, chemically. It increases contractility, and so the heart actually would beat more forcefully. That's what that word contractility means. The heart will beat more forcefully and the heart beats as like a ringing motion. So if you've ever taken a sort of like a, uh, a t-shirt, okay, you take a t-shirt, fold it in half, so it's about this long, dip it into a bucket of water, and then bring it out, right? If you just squeeze it, you won't get nearly as much fluid out as if you ring it. That's how the heart beats. The heart beats in a ringing motion, kind of like you're trying to wring out a wet t-shirt, okay? So contractility is the forcefulness of that twisting contraction. Norepinephrine increases contractility. Now, unfortunately, a side effect of norepinephrine is it causes an increase in vascular resistance. And so a vascular resistance means the resistance to flow that the blood experiences as it's moving through the blood vessels. So total peripheral resistance is a term that we use. And if you have total peripheral resistance, out here in the vascular network, if this decreases, I'm sorry, if this increases, this is going to lead to a decrease in venous return. Okay, so these are like just different statements over here. So a decrease in venous return, which is the opposite of what we wrote down here, is going to lower ventricular filling, and it's gonna lower preload. Ultimately, you'll have lower rate of cardiac output. Make sense? So the initial increase in contractility is a good thing, and then it's followed in weeks to months later by a secondary problem in the periphery where you actually have more peripheral resistance from the released norepinephrine. So this leads us to sort of our second mechanistic pathway of how the heart is going to try to increase its cardiac output in a failing situation, in a congestive heart failure patient or a chronic heart failure patient. So the second system is it conserves water, okay? It's an initial thought 
that's helpful, but it has also very short-term, near-term consequences. So if you look at the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, remember renin is released and has activity um, at the level of the kidney, and it conserves water so you don't pee it out. And you increase your fluid volume in the blood circulation, that increases blood pressure, right? But that volume first increases venous return. So as the venous return increases, you get more filling, greater contractility, and then you get more cardiac output. But if you have a high blood volume, you also raise your blood pressure. And so in weeks to months after that compensatory mechanism, you have an increase in afterload or mean arterial pressure. And in doing that, now you're right back to this vicious cycle of where you started. Okay? So the first solution, weeks to months of benefit. The second solution, weeks to months of benefit. The third solution is more like months to maybe years. So there's a peptide that's released out of the atrium, atrial natriuretic peptide, that's AMP. AMP is released, and it's detected by large blood volume, where the atrium is swelling beyond what it's supposed to swell. So it releases this natriuretic peptide, and the word naturesis means to do what? What does the word naturesis mean? Any ideas? Because no, that's why you're here. Does it increase the sodium? It does. See, you guys know this. The, the, the word naturesis, or natriuretic peptide, is it increases the amount of sodium that's excreted in the urine. And water follows sodium, so the water leaves as well. That's diuresis. And now you pee out your excess blood volume, and you actually reduce mean arterial pressure by dropping blood pressure. So, the last mechanism gives the patient maybe more months to years of compensation. But then after that, they're, they're done with all of their tricks, physiologically. And so one of the first things that we go to when we're treating a patient with congestive heart failure, chronic heart failure, is we use extra diuretics. We'll give them more diuretics that makes them go pee. Right? We're using that third mechanistic pathway, but we're doing it more aggressively. That reduces their blood pressure reduces by, by reducing their blood volume, then the heart doesn't have to work as hard. Make sense? But that's about it. It's a chronic situation that gets worse and worse and worse over time. And it's essentially an inevitable process that eventually the heart's going to fail. So if we look at different failure modes, um, We'll talk about here in a second, left versus right-sided heart failure. So as the heart is trying to compensate, this Frank Starling law that we introduced in the intro, it talks about how the heart's going to move through a compensation mechanism, either norepinephrine or renin angiotensin or AMP. But eventually, the compensation leads to a decompensation where it makes the problem worse. And then you continue to progress, the patient progresses into uh, higher levels of chronic heart failure. This whole time, the heart is working harder, so you get hypertrophy of the heart. So the heart itself will enlarge, it'll swell, it'll, it'll, it's like it's working out. And as it hypertrophies in size, it's taking more energy. It's essentially exercising to a greater extent than what you and I do on a regular basis. And because of that, in these patients that have end-stage or progressed chronic heart failure, they have this condition known as body-wasting, cardiac cachia. Because of the extra metabolic demand of the heart just to work and just to beat, uh, it sucks a lot more ATP, and so the heart itself is like this exercising organ 24-7. And the patients start losing dramatic amounts of weight over time. So if we compare and contrast left versus right-sided heart failure, our left-sided heart failure is referring to really this side of the heart. Remember, this is the patient's anatomy, so it's as if you're looking at me. So this is my left side. So this was drawn perfectly. I didn't even, you know, make mention of that. But the left-sided heart failure, the pressures on this side are much higher 
than the right side. This is the working side of the heart. That's the working muscle. So the left side of heart failure patients, the causes there are either ischemic disease, where you get a narrowing of the vasculature. We'll talk about what causes that in the second part of today's lecture. You get a narrowing of the vasculature, so not as much blood flow goes to the working organ. Um, that's number one. Number two is you could get systemic hypertension. That's a fancy way of saying mean arterial pressure or afterload goes up. But that's the word that you hear clinically, is the patient in room five, not only is he an SOB, but he's hypertensive. Okay? You all know affectionately what that statement really means now, right? So they're a hypertensive SOB. I mean, there's, it doesn't get much worse than that. Okay? So systemic hypertension is mean arterial pressure only. All right. Mitral aortic valve disease. Okay, so the two valves that are at greatest risk of wearing out in our lifetime are on the left side of the heart because it's the high pressure side of the heart. The mitral valve, the bicuspid valve, is uh, in between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So mitral valve failure, you'll get a regurgitation, you'll get backward flow when it's supposed to be closed. Or the aortic valve, which is the one that opens and closes as it flows out. So the aortic valve and the mitral valve are at the greatest risk of failure. We very rarely have to replace the tricuspid valve because the pressures over here are very low pressure. And then, of course, the patient could have some sort of genetic predisposition or could have a myocardial disease, myocarditis, endocarditis. These are diseases that are you know, wired within the genome. And unfortunately, the heart is in a weakened state. The morphology or what it looks like, we've talked about a lot of these things. You get hypertrophy, enlargement of the heart itself. We get a dilated ventricle, okay, so it blows out, usually on the left side only. And I'll show you some pictures of this. And then this is where we're ending up. We get pulmonary congestion and edema, and that's where I was talking about. You go from 100 milliliters of fluid in that pleural space to like a liter a day. A liter a day because it continues to build up. And a liter a day is at the point where the patient's like, uncle, take me in and get me treated for something. And a lot of them get like a pleural X or a port put in to drain it at home. So it's a little bit more convenient, okay? So the biggest impact on the pulmonary circuit uh, on, is on the pulmonary circuit on the left side. Because if you back up, if you look at our diagram, if you back up from the aorta, you're backing up to the lungs. And so that's where all that fluid, that edema and pulmonary congestion ends up in the lungs on the left side of heart failure patients. Make sense? Any questions about that? So what are our symptoms? Some of these words are gonna be uh, very, very familiar, right? We have shortness of breath. We have cough. Uh, we have shortness of breath while we're lying down. Um, and again, and, and one of your colleagues wanted to understand really the difference between shortness of breath and like apnea. So like in an apneic event, which we didn't really cover, but in apnea, um, that's an interruption in breathing, like while you're sleeping, okay? But it's not really shortness of breath because the breath is there once the airway is re-maintained. And when apnea, uh, sleep apnea becomes an issue is when you get X number of apneic events over a night cycle, okay? But in shortness of breath, this is, you know, this would be like you climbing flights and flights of stairs or hiking to Mount Humphreys uh, in Summity, and you get short of breath, and then you stop hiking to catch your breath. But imagine if there was no catching your breath, okay? So it's like, even in a healthy young group like this, you experience shortness of breath, but it was like for a moment in time. Then you stop doing what you were doing to catch your breath. And there is, in, in these patients, there is no cessation of that feeling. It's actually more chronic. Okay? A lot of times it helps if you lay down, but you can imagine if it goes from shortness of breath while you're standing or working or walking or moving, to shortness of breath even while you're lying down, that's a big impact on your quality of life. Tach tachycardia, so the heart itself is beating at a faster rate. Mitral regurgitation, 
right? There's so much extra fluid in the hearts under extra pressure that you get a regurgitation of sound from the mitral valve. And that, that sounds like a, uh, a swoosh as it's supposed to be silent in between heart cycles. Atrial fibrillation is another side effect because the atria itself is starting to expand or stretch beyond what it's supposed to. And so it thinks that it's supposed to beat again, but it's out of sync, so you're gonna get atrial fib. All right, so let's look at right side heart failure. The causes of right side heart failure are really, most commonly, left side heart failure. So the heart itself, as it backs up to the lungs, if you have a higher fluid load in the lungs, and the right side is pushing to the lungs, you almost have the equivalent that we had over here when our afterload is elevated on the left side. So it's almost as if after the patient has left-sided heart failure, that becomes the afterload problem for the right heart. Make sense? And so the most common issue associated with right-sided heart failure is the patient first begins with left-sided heart failure, you have pulmonary edema, pulmonary congestion, that puts extra pressure back on the right side of the heart valve, and now the patient's basically wrestling with full, complete heart failure. Some of the other causes, though, they're less common. You have primary lung parenchymal diseases, or like cystic fibrosis, we looked at that last week. We have different types of lung vascular diseases where the lung itself uh, becomes ischemic or becomes complicated. Um, another one that I add to the list would be lung tumors. So the heart's gonna have to start working harder in cancer patients that have um, uh, primary masses in the lung that are large. That's gonna put pulmonary edema into the lung itself and the heart might be fine to begin with, but you might start seeing right side problems that are unrelated to the left side of the heart. The biggest impact is on the systemic circuit because if you back it up this way, you go back to the body and the system. And if you carry the inferior vena cava downward, you're gonna to start to recognize, okay, well, congestive hepatomegaly, right? So that's a enlarged heart that are in large liver that has congestion of fluid because the portal circulation is heavily dependent upon venous flow. So the liver itself becomes congested. You may actually have uh, elevated pressures within the uh, liver circulation, and now you might shut down the production of certain liver enzymes. Pleural effusions in the lung, and then peripheral edema. So the patient itself is gonna have a large amount of fluid like in the legs, in the distal extremities. And that in of itself can be extremely um, painful or frustrating. Have you guys ever like sprained an ankle um, uh, so bad that um, it like, it almost felt like your skin was gonna burst? Like you, you know, you, you wrap it and then it like felt like it was too tight so you undo it. And, and you look like you have like an elephantitis on your, on your foot. That's what these patients look like with peripheral edema is it's on both sides and it's painful. So they'll elevate the patient's leg above the heart to try to encourage venous return. They'll wrap the patient's leg very aggressively to try to put exterior, uh, exterior compression forces and encourage blood flow, but it's painful. Like these patients will complain and it feels like their skin's about to swell because their legs are so swollen. They can swell like three times the size of their normal leg. Okay, that's what's happening in this peripheral edema. It's very, very severe. So let me ask you this question as we prepare for the final. Right-sided heart failure and right-sided heart failure may lead to, I'm sorry, left-sided heart failure, left-sided heart failure may lead to right-sided heart failure owing to or as a result of excessive volume retention, poor perfusion of the right coronary, increased right ventricular afterload, or arterial hypotension. Which one do you guys like the best? A's, B's, C's, or D's? Okay, C's have it. 
Absolutely. That's what we were kind of talking about is increased right ventricular afterload. It backs up from the left side and goes over to the right side. Make sense? Okay. Question. Why not A? Excessive volume retention. So the, the, when we talk about volume retention, we're thinking more of like um, the, the body itself is, is retaining fluid. So that wouldn't necessarily be a cause. It'd be more of an effect. So that would be peripheral edema that's a result of, but it's not really a cause. Okay. Good question. All right, let's um, take a nice break here because we're going to shift gears into vascular problems away from the heart. And then we'll come back to the heart.